those methods of breaking down the champions are borderline useless, if not completely useless, if not detrimental to the way that people see the game. Alright, so the main topic today is talking about how the how do we categorize champions and how useful is it, right? And the primary way of categorizing champions in game is definitely their their system that says assassins, fighters, mages, marksmen, supports, and tanks. Um, if you look at uh, the wiki, uh, this is the the fan made wiki. There's a little bit more options: uh, warden, vanguard, burst, uh, enchanter, etc. Now. This isn't the only way of categorizing champions. These are, but this is, I think, the most common way. I, besides putting champions in the specific lanes, like saying I'm a mid laner, um, or saying you're a support player, um, or a tank player, which is a little bit better. But if you go by Riot's way of categorizing tanks, it won't, won't be that much better. Um, the only other really ways or real ways of separating champions is normally by like tier lists or the meta or like what pro players are playing uh, or about the ease of difficulty like over here you can say like what champions are quote unquote easy compared to difficult right and kind of the point of today oh am I, can I take this away the, the point of today is to explain that those methods of breaking down the champions are borderline useless if not completely useless if not detrimental to the way that people see the game so, what is the alternative? The alternative is to break down champions specifically by what what do they do to truly carry the game? Or, what do they do that counters the primary ways of carrying a game? Uh, for example, a primary like proactive way of carrying the game would be engaging a team fight like a Mumu. Uh, and the opposite of that would be to disengage in team fight like a Janna. So, while you can proactively carry with a Mumu, you can't proactively disengage because if you're not there for the team fights. If the enemy team doesn't try to team fight you and instead they do go for poke, then Janna's disengage becomes much less relevant. Whereas Amumu's engage is pretty much always going to be relevant. Uh, and that's the, the main difference between primary uh, and secondary archetypes. And so the archetypes are just ways of doing one of those two things. Proactively carry the game or uh, reactively stopping your opponent from carrying the game. The reason why breaking down champions in that way is so much more effective than categorizing them by mid laners or by, for example, mages, uh, is because the skill will translate over. Um, if you d are doing well with a champion that has high burst, the, the if-then statement, the equation of what to do on a burst champion to carry the game does not change. Like, if you're playing one burst champion and then you play another burst champion, this, that's it's the same equation going through your mind. Now, the mechanics, the specific things you do to do those things might change, but saying for example here i'll use the map i can go wait in this bush wait for someone to walk by me and then blow them up it's something that every burst champion can say right um whereas if you are a mid laner or a mage player um just because you do something like on azir where you're standing back um or cassiopeia doesn't mean you're going to do well in like ezreal or fiddlesticks or Cho'Gath. like the way they see the game is like fundamentally different because they have different archetypes for the game. And so archetypes is going to actually simplify the game much better and much more concisely than the roles given here or even the roles here. Although I will say that here is a little bit better. Um, so let's go over the list of archetypes before I continue. So there are the proactive main archetypes are going to be burst, split push, backline, juggernaut, pick, engage, and assassin. And the wrath of uh, sub archetypes are going to be tanks, dive, poke, wave clear, pill, and disengage. Now, if, if you are keeping up, then you can see that, for example, tank is an archetype. Um, however, the way that Riot breaks down tank is not the same way that I will break down tank. And we'll, we'll go over that. Um, for example, I don't think because you do well on a Mumu, that's going to translate over to you doing well on Camille. Or Aatrox, uh, they're they're quite different in their fundamental approach, and I, they actually have different archetypes than the tank of Alistar and Amumu. Um, and that's even true here, where again they they do a lot better with actually breaking down the champions um, into different roles. However, 
they're also too loosey goosey with it. Like they're not as straightforward. Um, Car- Karma, I don't think it's good, and, or even Silas are not burst champions in the same way. And even Twisted Fate, to be honest. Um, although I would say he's kind of on the, uh, the lower end. Um, their dive is, I think, is actually pretty accurate, except for like I don't know, Skarner. Um, whereas I think the Juggernaut's actually pretty good too. So, like I said, this website's a little bit better. However, it goes almost like too in depth. Like I think if I ask someone like what a warden is, they're not gonna know what the hell that means, um, or a vanguard. Um, and like some of these champions have arc- uh, engaged, and some of them don't. And <clears throat> so again, we're, I'm gonna break it down hopefully in a way that's clearer uh, than both of these sites in a way that if you actually understand the champion and you understand yourself, it's going to correlate together for you to achieve uh, more in depth concepts like understanding archetypes is a prerequisite to like creating your champion pool uh, understanding the meta for like for your point of view instead of understanding the general mana under- if you know that you're going to engage champions you need to be breaking down the meta in terms of engaged champions like it doesn't matter if the best champion in the game is the backline champion if you're bad at being a backline player right um Understanding your champion builds is directly proportional to understanding your archetypes because items just like champions have have archetypes as well. Um, e- even just understanding how League of Legends is balanced is predicated on champion archetypes. Uh, the example I normally give for this is Ash compared to Caitlyn. Like Caitlyn's almost strictly a backline champion, and Ash is also a backline champion. However, Ash has the ability, like a very, very good ability of getting picks uh, with her ultimate. Her ultimate is one of the better pick abilities in the game. And, and so if Ash was on par with Caitlyn with being a backline champion, but also had uh, that amount of skill in terms of her pick, she would just be better than Caitlyn like, specifically, like, or in general. Like, you would just play Ash, right? And so to even just understand like how the game's supposed to be broken down, this is like the way that the game should be balanced, right? And, and I think right understand this even if not like directly at least in- intuitively um, they they know that there's only a amount of a certain amount of allotment points you're, you should give to a champion that, so you can have them get have a bunch of archetypes like someone like Ari or Yasu but you can't go overboard with any of them or else they start invalidating other champions which used to be more common but I think nowadays it's been uh, much much better before like Drafting a team and understanding macro, these, this, that's also predicated to understanding archetypes. You, you have to know how your, your, you know, the pieces of the puzzle come together. And if you don't actually know the puzzle pieces, you're going to have a pretty hard time doing that. Um, and one of the more applicable um, ways of understanding this would be for line of scrimmage. Like understanding team fight positioning and priorities is, again, like, you must understand archetypes before you understand any of the concepts I've just mentioned. Like archetypes is the foundation of understanding League of Legends, um, and there's not a clear way of learning this besides intuition and uh, just experience. And even so, when when that when those kind of thoughts aren't structured, it's very easy to get things mixed up. It's very easy to start thinking that your bruiser champions. Are, are the same to think that e- Echo is going to play the same way that Fiora is or D- Darius is or Aurelia and so even if you have that intuition if without an actual system it can still end up being quite flawed in terms of the effectiveness w- once you start applying it to the advanced concepts or more advanced like, concepts all right so here are the list of archetypes um, there's the main archetypes that are proactive so burst which We'll get into quantifying these things a little bit more in detail later. Later, but burst is you have to be able to do a you know a significant amount of damage in a short period of time. You can see my general description with Vigar being uh, my my example here. And the qualities underneath burst are things that kind of that bolster burst champions. So the number one thing would be just more damage. But having some kind of inherent healing reduction effectively increases your damage as, uh, as well or just the in the mobility to get to places to then burst them is another positive quality and with enough burst and enough mobility you become an assassin right so it's really assassins really just a mix of those two archetypes whenever specifically whenever your burst becomes high enough that they die within like a second uh, maybe two seconds um, okay the next is going to be split push 
which the description here is pretty vague in terms of like being in a side lane but the key you know the operative word there is threatening like they need to be able to apply enough pressure that them being in the side lane is actually effective for the macro um and you'll get to understand that again i have an archetype sheet at the i'll have that in the description of this video where i will explain i will show not only who which champions are which archetypes but i'm actually going to be working on grading those things on the live stream right now um and so by the time you watch the video and you look at that link it might already be all graded so you can kind of see where i put each champion uh, my example here is going to be Trindamir, who's extremely threatening in the side lane. Back line just means you're effective at long range. Basically, anyone with range is going to be effective at long range, unless you're doing some weird build. Um, juggernaut. Again, the operative word with Juggernaut is going to be threatening. Like, There's a big difference between Leona being in your back line compared to Renekton being in your back line. Right? Um, and it might seem similar to another tank being in the back line. But when you start thinking about the line of scrimmage, which is another video uh, I'll have uploaded on the channel really soon, the way it affects that line of scrimmage, the way it bends the line of scrimmage is going to be dramatically different. I can go, I think I'm going to have to make an entirely different video if I want to break down each archetype um, one by one. Um, I don't want this video to be too long, so I'm just going to go over like, the general things. Pick, Picking is, yeah, just display, displacing a, a target. Basically, I would, like, the easy way of thinking about this is if your team is being sieged by five people, can you do something to, to make one person on the enemy team like extremely vulnerable? So can you pull them into your team with like Blitzcrank? Can you knot them up and then pull them like Nautilus? Can you Camille alt and push everyone else away? Can you grab his alt and push everyone else away? Like, can if you can do that to one player and make them really vulnerable in this situation you're a pick champion uh, very similarly if you're an engaged champion you can do the same thing with the multiple multiple players reliably I, the operative word in these in pick and engage uh is reliably as compared to threatening and the other ones reliably is definitely the most important uh we'll go over that a little bit more in detail later but to give one example now while we're here is while scion theoretically can knock up multiple targets with his ultimate he cannot reliably do that and so if I was very good at being an engaged player on a Moomoo, where I basically at any given situation that people are grouped, I can always be looking for that engage. If I switched to Scion, I would not be able to use that same thought process to consistently make good plays on Scion. Again, that might happen probably not even once a game, but like once every couple games, and it might be amazing and might destroy them after I hit multiple people with my ultimate. But it's, we don't really consider a champion an archetype unless they do it reliably. And so Scion is not an engaged champion. And I already mentioned uh, Assassin a little bit earlier, where it's a mix of burst and dive. Again, the important thing to remember here is like, they need to die. You're a burst and not an Assassin. If if you after you use your first rotation, they're not dead. If you, you're an Assassin, whenever you, when you use your rotation and they are dead. That's the real big difference. And is, the reason why there's, there has to be a significant uh, breakdown there is because if I make the same play on... Let's say mm, Wukong, right? So I'm doing the normal, like, bursty Wukong build, but not assassin build. Um, and then I try to have that same decision making on Wukong as I do with Talon. I'm going to kill myself on Wukong, like, often. Because my target's not going to die, and I'm going to be put in a bad position. Whereas if I have that thought process, I'm very good at seeing that, oh, I can dive here, and I can burst, and I can kill this guy immediately. On on, a, on Talon, and then I switch that to playing Rengar, like, it's going to be the same equation. So, to try and help you guys not be confused with the Assassin compared to Burst Dive, they need to die in, in that in that time frame. They need to die on that first rotation. Which, to be honest, m most champions don't have that. Um, they need to become ahead to actually get to that quality. Which, I, I guess, is an important time to mention that when we're looking at archetypes, we're really thinking about champions if the score is 0-0-0, zero, 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 and we're 20-ish minutes into the game. Cause that's going to be the most important time and the most like effective time that you're using your archetypes to actually carry. Um, at least from a team perspective. I do think early game is more important. But um, it, whether you do well in your champion past the beginning mark um, is going to be 
dependent on this the archetype in the middle of the game and if they're even. If you're doing great and you're doing amazing, you don't have to really worry. Like your burst champions are probably be going to become assassins. Your tanks might become juggernauts. But we're not worried about when you're winning. We're worried about just generally, uh, on, you know, reliably. How re how reliable is your champion's archetype so you can have consistent results. All right, to, mo to move on to the sub-archetypes, which are, you know, again, just for active things, things that you can't really, you're not going to proactively be able to carry with these uh, unless your opponents give you that that option, right? Um, so there's tank, which, you know, pretty straightforward. Uh, it's, it's about how long can you really st stand in the front, right? That's a simple way of putting it. Dive, just mobility. Poke is uh, the effective range. I put that range just about at 900. Um, but the, the key thing about understanding poke is that if we go back to the five five man sieging example, if you are not a poke champion, if when your team is sieging, you're not pushing people out of lane. If you're you know if you're playing Caitlyn and you're like hitting people with the Q every once and so, uh, you know one and every like forever, um, and it's only doing like a hundred something damage, like you're not a poke champion, like. If they, they're going to almost outkill you with just like an ocean dra dragon, then you're probably not a poke champion. And so there needs to be a significant amount of damage in, that, in your champion's poke ability for you to be considered a poke. And again, this has to be like mid-game. So always just think about like a 5v5 situation mid. I think that makes it uh, clear. In the same vein, you're not a wave clear champion unless when your team is being sieged, you're not... You're, if you think, oh, I can clear this wave and protect this tower, you are a wave clear champion. If you're playing... I don't know, Lucian, yeah, yeah, you theoretically can kill the wave, but when the team is, the enemy team is sieging, like, you're very, you're not reliable on, to be like, okay, don't worry, guys, I'll clear it. Not in the same way that Anivia is, not in the same way that Ziggs is, um, or Sivir, right? So, it's, again, it's about being reliable. We want to have very reliable archetypes so that we have consistent results, and when we build our champion pool, which is probably going to be my next stream, it, our skills will translate. Again, that's the main reason why archetypes is better than understanding the other ways of breaking down the game is because the skills translate to one another and it, that creates an incredible amount of mm, cohesion and not just understanding archetypes but understanding the concepts I say build up build up from archetypes pill is a sin pill and engage disengage are just the opposite of pick and engage you just have to be able to reliably do whatever I, we talked about but defensively right so I put like Braum as a good pill because while his ultimate, theoretically, again, theoretically can knock people up um, and start a team fight, it's much easier for Braum to do his job defensively. Much, much easier for him to jump to his, his AD carry, make them tankier, auto attack, Q the person trying to attack his AD carry, um, and then alt that person. That's much, much simpler than Braum trying to start a team fight. And so, while I wouldn't consider him an, an engage, I will consider him a pill. Um, and to some degree, it disengage when its ultimate is available. The same thing is true with uh, Sona. All right, but that's gonna be like again my brief breakdown of all the archetypes. There, I might make more videos specific to archetypes, maybe like short short videos for each archetype, going into more detail about with each, with each of these archetypes. There's like level one. Like if you're a level one champ player at these champions. Um, you're going to do like the very basic burst things, but there are, trust me, there are magnitudes levels higher than that once you get better and better at, at that archetype. And I, I probably will eventually make videos on the advanced uh, techniques of mastering this archetype. But your first goal is going to be identify which archetype you're better, the, you're best with in the first place, which again will be in the next. Alright, so the next topic to talk about is reality versus theory. Uh, I had previously already mentioned uh, Sion as an example of, while in theory he can engage in reality is not reliable enough that's what that's what again reliable is all, almost always like the, the most important term when we're talking about this uh, a good exa uh, additional example is pantheon where if you read pantheon's abilities uh, on you know if we go here and we go to pantheon and we read through his abilities it's not going to mention that he has an aoe hard cc and so you might think that he must not be in uh, an engaged champion because engaged champions need an AoE hard CC, but this is where reality versus theory comes in and how real and it's being a reliable source. In the example where you alt on top of the enemy team, especially if you alt behind that enemy team, that animation is going to 
cause your opponent to react. And in this case, they're going to react by most likely running away from the direction that the Pantheon's animation is coming from, right? And I am, this is the old illustration of his ultimate, but it's still true now, although to a lesser extent, um, where the players in this in this cir the circle or, you know, the new, like, line are going to react and run away from that point. And that's a very reliable thing to happen. Like, most people just run away from that, right? Um, in, in almost every scenario. And so it's, just, it's very reliable. So you have to think about that run away is a form of CC called fear, right? And so while his ability doesn't literally have fear built into it, it in reality, it causes his opponents to run, right? And so it, it performs itself as a fear. And that's a very important distinction. Understand what things really do compared to the idea the idea of what they should do or like what they specifically uh, do in game. And this isn't just for abilities of champions. It, it's also true for just the way that you look at the game. Whenever you're analyzing your gameplay, the meta of your rank, the meta for your region, in your truth, your reality, is going to be different than, from someone in a different region playing League. Especially different from someone a much higher or much lower rank than you. Like Your reality is what you're trying to beat. You're not trying to beat the theory of the perfect gameplay. Or the theory of, you know, like bad gameplay if you're like in a low rank. You're trying to just play the game well and outplay the reality of of your meta, of your competition. Uh, the last thing I'll talk about is something like are the champions who enable other champions. So something like Shin um, or Galio. Uh, th these champions can alter, consistently alter another champion's archetype. However, they themselves do can't reliably force and engage. So, you, if you, for example, if you play Galio and just no one on your team ever goes in, then you're not going to be able to perform any kind of engaging act, right? And so you can tell that there's some dependency on on Galio. And so while he he is a factor for following up on engage, I don't consider Galio in, engage. Just think about this kind of stuff whenever you are trying to evaluate champions or items. Always think about like what do they really do. Um, I always teach people like jungle, jungle tracking, and after I teach them how to create their own jungle paths, they start predicting their opponent's path based on what they would do. But that's, again, that's not how it works. Like, you think about at your rank, what do you expect them to do? You know, it's always reality is better than theory. Although theory is very fun uh, to th talk about and decide and really think about for yourself. How you interact with others should be throughout. The archetypes that we just went over were backline, tank, engage, and pick, respectively. Let's now look at the qualities these these archetypes require and or strive on to be effective. We'll begin with tank, a fairly simple archetype. What does a tank really need in order to be effective? We'll apply that question to Malphite. What makes Malphite a tank? It's funny that some people have trouble really answering this question, although most everyone will agree that Malphite is a tank or that Amumu is a tank. But not everyone can identify what makes them that way in comparison to other champions. A question I often ask is, if Malphite and Caitlyn both had 2000 HP and had the same base stats, which champion is tankier? Malphite's passive is a 10% shield based on his health pull, which inherently takes um, his opponents longer to kill him, so obviously he's tankier. This is a form of damage mitigation. Malphite's Q steals movement speed from his opponents. For champions relying on auto attacks, this means... If they were normally supposed to hit you because their auto attack was off cooldown, but now they can't because you stole their movement speed and you ran out of their range, you are effectively lowering their attack speed, aka you're lowering their DPS. Malphite's E, the ground slam, is a cripple, which is a term that references lowering your opponent's attack speed. So unlike Malphite's Q, which indirectly lowers his atta opponent's attack speed, his E does it directly. Both his Q and his E are forms of DPS reduction. Malphite's W grants some passive armor, and that effect is triple while his shield is active. This is a form of damage reduction. Lastly, there is Malphite's ultimate, which is a knockup, which is the best form of CC in the game because um, it can't be reduced by tenacity. And obviously, while your opponent is knocked up, they can't be doing damage to you, right? So 
When we look through Malphite's abilities and passive, everything about him makes him more tanky. That's why Malphite's a tank, but let me ask you, what makes a Moomoo a tank? Pause here and post in the comments below if you have any ideas. Alright, you ready? So think about it for a second. As we scroll through Malphite's skills, we were able to see very apparently that everything makes him tankier, right? But do you think we'll find the same outcome when it comes to a Moomoo? Surprisingly, no. A Moomoo's kit doesn't exactly tie very much to being a tank. If you read through his abilities, um, his only real damage reduction uh, or form of tankiness comes from his E, which is mainly designed around making him tankier against uh, jungle mobs. Not very effective when it comes to actually being um, used against champions. Now, he does have a couple forms of CC in his Bandage Toss and Curse of the Sad Mummy, but just having CC doesn't really make you a tank or else there'd be many more tanks in the game. Remember, just because Pantheon has a shield doesn't make him a tank. It makes him tankier, but what pushes us to consider a champion an archetype is whether they can effectively do the job we expect from said archetype. We don't expect Pantheon to frontline our push, right? This is an important distinction to make, and I'll speak more about it in later examples. Anyway, what really makes a Moomoo a tank are the items and runes you take on him. Items in the game, along with runes, also have archetypes. They can show up your weaknesses, or they can bolster your strengths. As you can see here, the items and runes you take on uh, a Moomoo basically create an archetype. Uh, we do this because a Moomoo's kit basically forces him to be in melee range, and without a tankiness quality, you're pretty much a useless champion. You can try to do the whole AP build thing, um, and it can work in certain situations, but um, naturally being tankier is going to make his job much easier. Let's take a look at the backline archetype now. Earlier we looked at it in regards to Caitlyn, but now let's take a look at Janna. Janna also has long range and long range abilities, but that's not the only factor when it comes to backline. Like That will make you a backline, but it won't make you an outstanding backline champion. When we take a closer look at her abilities, we can see that she possesses a knockup, a slow, a shield, a knock back, a heal, and movement speed. Backline champions love movement speed because it means that while they're kiting their opponent, uh, their opponents can have to go a longer distance to really reach them. The same is true with knockbacks and knockups. If you knock up your opponent, um, they're going to be in a duration of CC where you can either kite or be, do damage to them, right? Um, however, if they have to dodge that knockup, let's say if they have to go around it, that means they're not going a straight line, aka they're going a longer distance to reach you. So they both effectively do the same thing, but in different ways. The same principle can be applied to like Caitlyn's traps. If our opponents has to go around those instead of running straight to Caitlyn, it means that they've had to traverse a longer um, distance. All of these are tools that enhance the backline archetype. What enables a champion to carry, or in other words, what does a champion do to increase their team's win ratio? Let's start with Caitlyn. She's a pretty simplistic champion when it comes to her overall tools of, of how she's going to carry a game. The thing that stands out about Caitlyn is obviously her range. She's 650 base range and has additional long range abilities. Uh, this all helps Caitlyn be very effective at long range. Amumu, what does he really do to carry a game? For one, you'll see Amumu frontlining for his team. This is helping his team when it comes to skirmishes and team fightings as he's soaking up damage for his team, providing clearance for the damage dealers. Speaking of providing clearance, there's a bigger effect that Amumu has and it comes in the form of his ultimate. Amumu's ultimate allows him to initiate teamfights and engage, which when done effectively can win a teamfight outright. Why he can do this while someone like Caitlyn cannot is because Amumu possesses an ability that applies a hard CC to multiple opposing champions. Lastly, let's look at Blitzcrank. Blitzcrank's kit revolves around a single ability, which isn't uncommon in League. His notorious hook is one of the best pick abilities in the game, and is complemented by his movement speed, knockup, and silence. Along with this, Blitzcrank is a tank. Now he's not as good of a tank as someone like Amumu or you know Cho'Gath, but he still has a tank quality to him. Since so much of his power has been used to enable his amazing pick, his tankiness pretty much has to take a hit. This exercise is really just to get you thinking about champions in a pretty simplistic way, um, but a very useful way. I want you to just think about like in your games, like when you play against Blitzcrank, like what's what do you see? Like what's annoying when he's on your team? What's really good? Not just Blitzcrank, but like, I want you to think about that with every champion, like just. Uh, Based on your game, your experience playing the game, like what do you remember about these champions that um, like stands out about them? In the comments, name a champion, tell me what qualities stand out to you about them, and how do they carry games?